a, a great experiment. Um, a great experiment in trying to um, exercise what we here in the Earth Sciences have uh, have been trying to do with Earth Cube. There's another competition or initiative that we have in trying to uh, bring together different disciplines and to uh, how the data can be can be um, exchanged and. Um, and the data can interact in order to produce tools for the community. So uh, the, at present, the, um, the data from the CCOs are in kind of uh, moving down uh, the track at different rates. And this is another slide from Sue, where she shows that, of course, the LiDAR data, all of the six existing sites, uh, already have uh, LIDAR, LIDAR data that was collected early on um, in, within the first or two years of funding. And so that uh, data have moved along quite well, the hydrological data, but there are still um, a lot to be done in the area of geomorpho geomorphological and biological data. And of course, that's an invitation to all of you who would also want to contribute into the, uh, to the CCOs. The next slide, um, I want to highlight some of the important accomplishments of the program. And in this case, um, the, uh, um, uh, in this case, it has to do with the uh, program uh, goal of uh, training the next generation of uh, new interdisciplinary uh, science that are uh, in the science, the new science that is or originating out of the CCOs. The number of students who have uh, been involved with the CCOs is actually conservative. The numbers that I have posted here in this slide, like 116 graduate students, of which 42 graduated, I don't think it's that current, but it's maybe represents the uh, uh, the, the uh, status in, perhaps about a year ago. Uh, and of, there are about 65 uh, undergraduate students, 53 have graduated. And um, so we have um, a, a number of students that are really outside of the, CCO, the CCOs, as well as those that are, are inside of the CCOs, have benefited from also a program that we have in EAR, which is the EAR Postdoctoral Fellowship Program. And this program has the next deadline is July 18, and it's uh, every year after that. And so we have a number of um, postdocs that have been able to work, uh, do research at the CCOs, taking advantage of this program. And again, they have come from the CCOs or even outside the CCOs. So it is the, the students or postdocs that are um, applied directly to the program. Uh, there may be, uh, we are planning to have a future postdoctoral opportunity for uh, cross-site research. And uh, we will be announcing this time this year. So this is something to be looking for. Um, uh, and this uh, postdoctoral opportunity will be for um, uh, postdocs that will want to work at three or more sites uh, within the network. Uh, in addition, I think the national office, of which I'm going to talk about next, um, is going to be looking for a postdoc uh, in this year to assist um, with the uh, critical zone network uh, activities and conducting also cross-site uh, research. The, um, if I... Um, uh, the uh, Christina River Basin and the Shell Hill um, uh, CEOs have actually uh, applied for a program that we have that is called Research Experience for Undergraduates and Research Experience for Teachers. And this is a, um, uh, uh, involves um, uh, uh, 
having like summer activities, so I, I, I encourage anyone that will also want to um, bring in students who are participating in the CCOs or, or from the outside students who want to be involved with these activities that the CCOs are conducting. Uh, the, um, there is also the, um, uh, the Integrate uh, CCO Science which is uh, five of the CCOs are participating in this, and they produce undergraduate courses, content, and material. And um, uh, it's also the important to mention that the CCOs in the last, um, over the last four or five years, have actually supported about 80 uh, students and postdocs who have been able to participate in overseas training and workshops. Um, Tim asked, asked me to mention that uh, the, there is a short course that he has been teaching at the Geological Society of America meeting. It was taught in 2013, and it will be taught again in 2014 in Vancouver. Uh, there is also a uh, training um, or an outreach activity that is conducted through the American Geological Institute, and this is specifically for uh, teachers, high school teachers, um, and it reaches about 16,000 teachers. And uh, what um, uh, they are provided with exercises that they can use, and exercises which are um, specifically dealing with critical zone science. Okay, moving along to the what is coming next, and unfortunately we cannot announce until probably in about a month we will be able to tell you um, more about the critical zone uh, observatory national office. Um, this, the function of this office is going to be the coordination of uh, CCO network search and educational activities and also to be uh, the outreach to the critical zone uh, community at large um, and the public uh, on behalf of the network. So this it will be a place where you can, uh, when the office is established, a place where you can um, uh, go as a point of contact uh, liaison with the community. It will have the function of promoting the, the, uh, the program and um, will represent the program at um, meetings uh, with organizations and will also assist in preparing um, proposals for workshops, short courses, and sessions. So if you, once the office is established, if you would like to um, uh, promote or if you, li if you like to um, uh, organize a, any of these activities, uh, please contact the, uh, the, the office. The office is also in charge of um, producing a quarterly uh, a critical zone observatory newsletter, and uh, we're going to develop and implement a speaker series. So this is going to be a very exciting development for the overall community to, to um, take out the word of the CCOs and, uh, and to um, actually show what are the accomplishments, the scientific, the scientific accomplishments. So one question that you may ask is actually how to become involved with the CCOs. So I think I already alluded to, to a number of ways that you can become uh, involved with the CCOs. There is a slide that actually talks about this. And that probably Tim has already um, uh, is presented it. But um, I would like to mention that some of the, um, the sites um, are, um, have seed grants in order to bring someone who may want to start a project, sort of like a pilot project. And uh, I think that the Luquillo and the Southern Sierra and uh, Shell Hills um, why these sites, these uh, seed grants. Um, they, uh, you can also seek funding from NSF um, programs, and I can tell you that over the last three or four years, 
the uh, core programs in the EAR surface earth processes um, section have provided about two and a half million to people outside the ZOs who have established uh, projects now working in the CZOs. So this is um, another avenue, and in addition to that, to the core programs, we also have initiatives to which uh, um, it's possible to apply. <coughs> you can, I don't want to go through all the list that is here, but you can also contact the, the PIs of the site and maybe um, send the students, um, use the data, um, and um, uh, uh, attend the workshop. There's going to be a series of workshops that are going to be organized and look at the website for um, where this, when these workshops are going to be taking place. And this year also we have an all-hands meeting. Uh, every other year the network has all-hands meetings and this year is going to be uh, at the uh, Southern Sierra ZZO in September 2014. So if you're interested in attending this, please contact Tim White or Roger Bell at uh, UC Merced. So um, I don't know if I have covered everything that is possible, but you, but you may think uh, there, may, there may be other possibilities. If you have any idea, please contact Tim or myself as well. So I would like to look a little bit into the future, and I don't have a glass all to tell you what is going to happen, but so I am therefore um, speculating. But I would say that from the point of view of the CTOs and NSF, the program welcomes uh, affiliation of new and existing sites or projects. That is, the sites, um, the 10 sites now cannot really, there are many holes, they cannot really cover all that is possible. So it will be if possible for another project, existing project funded by other sources to affiliate with the CCOs. I will also say that um, uh, that um, the, uh, um, there is a potential for, um, in order to fill these this holes, there is a potential for future CCOs that perhaps are going to be um, in an urban setting or perhaps in karst terrain. And I'm saying this because um, we have um, mega cities now in all over the planet, and they have a tremendous effect on the surrounding landscape. And this is an area that I think there are going to be initiatives in the future. So it's really uh, a good thing to begin to prepare for that. And maybe you would like to consider uh, organizing a workshop that deals with this topic and how to actually uh, create a CCO that would be in an urban setting. Or uh, the United States has a large area of the continent that is cars, uh, characterized by cars, and we have not yet a CCO that is in one of these areas. I will also look into the future, will say that there's probably going to be a, a competition in, that, in four years from now, and the, uh, all of the sites will be recompeting, and it's a good thing to think about this and prepare for the future. Um, and uh, the fourth opportunity that I present here is that the CCO uh, program is really grow growing, is growing uh, internationally, and so there is uh, an opportunity for engage, to engage internationally. So, in the next slide, um, I just want to um, show some of the um, other programs that, are, that have begun to develop uh, in the last four or five years. And uh, there is the European Commission Soil Track that began to, that was funded in 2010 and explicitly um, asked for um, collaboration with the U.S. So there's a number of the CCOs which are very, have very strong connection with the Soil Trek project. Um, there is also the French uh, network of river basins, and more recently the Critex project.
project, which is an equipment project that is also going to uh, provide a strong linkage to the U.S. CCOs and enlarge the, the program internationally. And in Germany, we have the Terreno uh, uh, project, which is the Terrestrial Environment Observatory. And in 2012, when the first uh, there was a first in China announced that they will um, create a yeah. Chinese um, critical zone observatory so program. So at present, uh, yeah. after sitting yeah. in China, I'm not sure if I can uh, go. Oh, well, actually, I, I probably could go this weekend. There. Um, <laughs> In the next slide, and um, we have the, um, some ideas about what international planning is uh, taking place. But after the China meeting, there was uh, the, a, a group created that is called the International CZO Steering Committee. And this uh, group is being led by Steve Benoit at the University of Sheffield. And you can see here the name of the other members. So uh, the next step for this um, committee, steering committee, and actually for the CCOs to um, grow internationally, is going to be a workshop that is going to be convened uh, in May of 2014. This is a, uh, the workshop to advance international critical on observatory science, and it has participation from representatives, scientific representatives, is a small number of scientists, but scientific representation and um, agency, funding agency representation from China, the US, UK, France, and Germany. So I will say, again, looking into the, um, uh, the glass ball, that the, um, perhaps one of the potential outcomes will be a joint call for proposals. So, um, be looking about this, be, be watching to see what um, comes out of this meeting. And uh, here in the U.S., we will try to have more outreach activities to engage the rest of the community and let them make them aware of what would be the next step. So in the next slide, I just want to, I'm taking um, here a figure that was produced in a report that Stephen War uh, from Sheffield and others um, um, this is a report that, uh, in which Steve and uh, a group of scientists internationally was involved in the fall of 2019, 2011, and this report actually um, outlines some of the possibilities for a, an international program. And the figure here shows all of the sites that are available globally for uh, that are either CCO, CCOs or related study sites. So um, the international um, CCO steering committee have actually, in preparation for the meeting that is going to be taking place in China in May, has launched a public consultation um, document. And I just want to make you aware that you can actually provide input for this public consultation, if you go to the um, uh, website, uh, the zzen.org website, and look into the forum, the document is there, and also a possibility to uh, provide your opinion as to how you think the international program uh, should be developed. So that's pretty much what I have to say, and uh, um, I'm sorry if I went over uh, time and I'm still not connected to the um, presentation, so it would have been a little bit difficult to know what it is that you're seeing there. But I'm hoping that I was in sync with the slides. So the next uh, presenter is going to. Uh, we're going to defer questions to the end, and the next presenter is uh, Gordon Grant uh, from um, the four. Forest Service and Oregon State University. And I would like to say that uh, Gordon is also uh, ad leading the um, advisory committee or the steering committee for the Critical Zone Observatory Network. So, Gordon, are you there? 
I am here. Can you hear me? Okay. I hope. Yes, okay. I can. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good morning, wherever you are around the world. And uh, thank you for allowing us to inhabit your desktops in this virtual fashion. Also, thank you for putting up with uh, the constant uh, door chimes as we work through this still uh, uh, imperfect technology. Um, I'd also like to thank all the people who helped me in the preparation of this talk by providing slides, materials, and ideas. And I apologize uh, to all my former friends whose material I didn't use for one reason or another. Um, as Enriqueta said, uh, the pr presentation I'm about to give is very much from the perspective of someone who is very engaged with the Critical Zone Network uh, as a member of the steering committee, uh, but doesn't have a, a particular dog in any particular fight. That is, I don't, I'm not associated with any particular site. So it's been a very real privilege to be able to in a sit astride the network and watch it evolve and really get to, uh, as part of the steering committee's role, to provide commentary, critique, suggestions, uh, and perspective that hopefully is useful in the implementation of this program. What I'm going to give uh, over the next uh, 40 minutes or so is some perspectives that have, uh, that seemed to me to be particularly germane in terms of the critical zone science, the nature, where the science is headed, uh, what is exciting about it, and, and ultimately try to answer this question of what's so critical about the critical zone. Um, I would remind you, again, if you're on the phone, please mute your phone so that we don't have any more interference. Than ever, sir. Okay. So um, it, the critical zone has been prosaically described as that place between the rock and the sky where water, sphere, ecosystem, soils, and rock all interact. And, of course, the simple answer to what's so critical about the critical zone is it's where we live. Um, it's critical in the sense of it is that zone, the near surface, that provides the full suite of, of services, processes, uh, and supports for the enterprise we call life. Um, despite its importance, however, it remains poorly understood. Uh, how does it form? How does it function? How is it, how is it likely to change in response to a, a whole suite of, of uh, impacts in, into the future? And so to address this, uh, in part to address this, this is not the, this is, the science is beyond the networks and the observatories that have been set up, but is really this burgeoning interest in the near surface and the full set of integrated processes that exist within the full near surface. That is what is stimulating and, and fostering the development of this international effort that Enriqueta uh, spoke to. So these critical zone observatories, as she described, have emerged over the last 10 years. Uh, major investment in the National Science Foundation, uh, European Union, now the Chinese, in promoting this kind of work. Um, and these sites are not, uh, are not marching in lockstep. That is, there isn't one agenda that these sites are pursuing. But they're all essentially working in this nexus uh, between the biological, the physical, and the chemical within this near-surface environment, between the atmosphere and the bedrock, and, describe, and attempting to characterize in an integrated fashion how the forcings, the climate forcings, the anthropogenic forcings, and, the, and even the tectonic and landform development forcings are affecting this nexus of physical biogeochemical processes. And the, in, the outputs, of course, being the things we care about, the water, the character of the water, uh, the, the nature of the vegetation, the, inner, the, the, the quality of, of and, and the fertility of soil. So all sites are working in this general arena, but, not, but each site is taking it in a different way, has a different portfolio of research investment, a different portfolio of observations. And one of the, the challenges, of course, of this kind of thing is to bring together these diverse sites in different geographies, topographies, uh, climates, uh, into some sort of common framework. And what I'm going to really be focusing on in this talk is where those commonalities uh, may be emerging. In general, the sites have adopted uh, and are pursuing questions that look something like this. 
uh, how do the processes that influence ecosystems change over both human and, and geologic time scales? What are the controls on the fluxes of carbon, uh, particulates, uh, gases? Uh, well, how does the movement of water through the site, how, does it, how is it transformed? Does it move from the atmosphere through the vegetation into the near surface and finally encounters the bedrock? And then finally, how do perturbations uh, that, that are either, uh, either anthropogenically imposed or just imposed by the evolution of the landscape itself changing all of this? So these are sort of the, this is the universe in which these sites uh, exist. Um, and again, not to, to uh, be redundant, but, but this has led to this development of both national, and as I'll point out in a few minutes, uh, international sites. But my attention today is really not so much on the infrastructure and the, the program of critical zone science, but on the science itself. I hope to sort of bring, uh, to illuminate some of the, what, what seem to me to be very interesting perspectives uh, that are, uh, emerging out of this 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 investment and 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 in a sense uh, it's an attempt to answer the question of is this investment worth it are we are we buying something new here are we buying uh, a new a new way of thinking about uh, the, the world and so to provide context for this I'm going to sort of start with the classic view this is the the textbook view of soil and and the movement of water through soil that that I received when I was in graduate school the the classic paper by Bevan and German of how water is moving down through this this porous medium uh, with with uh, generally decreasing uh, hydraulic conductivity and permeability as it moves down eventually encountering a impermeable uh, zone at the bottom and then moving laterally. And this is sort of the classic picture of, of, of soil. It's, and it served us well. It provides the foundation of many of the hydrologic models that we, we, we currently still, uh, we still use today. But what has emerged really out of the last 20 years, and, I'm, and, and not all this, of course, is at individual critical zone observatory sites, but it is very much a part and parcel of the critical zone uh, enterprise. What has emerged over the last uh, 20 years or so is a much more nuanced, much more interesting view of how the soil is structured and how uh, water, for example, moves through it. So here is uh, some, some work that's, that's almost uh, uh, 20 years old now from uh, Anderson et al. in the Coast Range of Oregon, showing how water is not just moving unidirectionally, but actually is moving down through both the porous medium, but also encountering fractures in the rocks, encountering a topography of, of bedrock that is forcing the water not just down and ladder, but in some cases up. And it is, subsurface water is reemerging as springs with implications for uh, issues like slope stability. So this, this, is, this, this uh, notion that fractures are important, that the, the structure of the underlying rock is a first order control on the movement of not just water, but of nutrients, of, of, of chemicals through the, the, uh, through, through the subsurface is, is, is uh, perhaps not an earth shattering, no pun intended, revelation, but it's providing us a, a, a notion that the soil is much more complex than this homogeneous medium. Of course, we're learning a lot about how these fractures develop, everything from geomorphic processes to climatic processes to even tectonic processes are are primary controls on, on the fracture spacing, on its architecture, uh, and on the kinds of, of and, and, and the spatial extent. So all of these now are, are to be brought to, into bear as we start thinking about the, uh, the structure of the critical zone. Moreover, we're beginning to see how these fractures are operating not just over, over space, but also over time. So the, the, the fracture network uh, is giving us uh, a, a way of thinking about how water moves through the soil. As in, in, this, in this image, the movement of water from the top down as the soil first wets up and then progressively becomes wetter over the course of the year, and different fractures are turning on and off uh, in, 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 as a consequence of these, these climatic inputs. So the, the fracture system is, is, is we, now ha we now have to account for it as cryptic as it may be, as hard to measure as it may be. Another perspective that's emerging is that water 
is not just water, and that trees, for example, are sourcing water from different that different origins that has different residence times. So here you see uh, a work that's showing how different species, uh, Douglas fir, say compared to live oak, are isotop receiving isotopically different water, and it's different water than that which exists in the soil. It's different water that's uh, that's coming out of the sky and shown on the meteoric waterline. So. What is the vegetation doing here? Why are some species using some water, whereas species right next to them are using different water? We don't know this yet, and it, yet it, it's fundamental to understanding how some species may be able to uh, better manage uh, a drought, for example, than, uh, than others. So this is, this is another perspective that's emerging. Another perspective that's emerging is that, that Critical zone processes, for example, carbon cycling, varies along very tight environmental gradients. So here's work from the Reynolds Creek uh, CZO, which shows the new Reynolds Creek CZO, which is showing how the different uh, strengths of different reactions that are cycling carbon are varying as we go uh, up elevation and uh, up a precipitation gradient. Now, you can begin to imagine, this is just a single site, how might this diagram change if we go to Lakeo, if we go to uh, the, the uh, southwest of the U.S., if we go to, the, uh, to, to an urban landscape. And so you're beginning to see how these different models of how material is being cycled and the controls that are being expressed uh, along environmental gradients uh, gives us this very complex picture of how the critical zone might be functioning uh, over both space and, and time. Um, another uh, insight that is coming from these studies is that the notion that the topography, the surface topography, is what controls the movement of water uh, is, is showing up to be, uh, uh, at least in some places, uh, uh, questionable because we are seeing how both chemical and water pathways are, are following cryptic, uh, perhaps fracture zones, perhaps macropores, perhaps uh, more conditioned by the topography of the subsurf bedrock than the surface topography. So this idea that, that surface topography is your cue to how the subsurface is working, well, we now need to re-examine this uh, in light of like, data. Some very interesting work that's coming out of the uh, Boulder Creek CZO is showing uh, the, the the complex uh, relationship between topography, uh, soil development, uh, vegetation, and and climate. So uh, mm -hmm. the seismic profiles across the valley bottom uh, reveal that the soil is not uniformly the same depth, but but in this case. Uh, is, is distinctly deeper on the north-facing slopes um, versus the south-facing slopes. The south-facing slopes have shallower soils, and the, as the upper right-hand panel shows, and, few, and distinctly fewer trees. And so somehow this patterning of the soil in terms of its depth is also giving rise to the pattern of vegetation. But what controls what? This is the fundamental question, and the work that... Uh, uh, Bob Anderson and, and, and others, uh, and the models they've, they've done should suggest that uh, the difference in thermal regimes between the north and south facing slopes, that is the colder north facing slopes uh, are more uh, subject to, to frost cracking and have been since Pleistocene. And that over time, this difference in the thermal regime giving rise to differences in expressed in terms of the depth of the soil is further uh, picked up on by the vegetation in terms of the vegetation development, in terms of the way snow is soiled, stored at the site, and eventually all the way to the evolution of the landscape itself, as shown in the, the lower right panel, that, that, that over time uh, steeper slopes are likely to arise on the south-facing versus the north-facing slopes as the sediment, the sediment transport relations have to accommodate this difference in sediment production and, and moisture. So this emerging picture is that everything's talking to everything else. The vegetation is talking to the soil, the rock is talking to the soil, and the, the, uh, uh, the, the climate is propagating its, its influences down into the, into the 
not just the, the vegetation, but into the soil mantle itself. This is a new set of ideas that are just coming to as, uh, as a result of this, of this work. Um, some very exciting work that's just come out uh, in PNAS uh, by uh, Jesse Hamm and, and Cliff Reby and others, uh, again, shows this relationship, this emerging relationship between the, the subsurface, the vegetation, and the climate. Here, what they did was look at the patterning of vegetation as in relation to the underlying uh, bedrock in the southern sea of Nevada. And what they find here as you work your way through these panels is that the trees really care about the geology. Uh, the vegetation patterns are strongly conditioned by the, by the nature of the subsurface bedrock. And apparently what is at least a, if not an overarching control, at least a strong correlate is the, the concentration of phosphorus in the bedrock itself. So you see in the first panel the, uh, the, the uh, concentrations of phosphorus that are sharply controlled by the uh, differences in the, in the granite type as shown in the right panel, uh, and that the vegetation is responding very tightly to this, uh, to this relationship. So, so isn't it remarkable that, that differences in the crystallization history of this granite uh, during the Cretaceous is giving rise to patterns of vegetation that are now visible from, from say, from outer space. And this is not just a local relationship. Their, their work further uh, shows how this is an, the, the CZO is, is plotted sort of in the center of the map, but this relationship between uh, bedrock phosphorus and tree cover uh, is, extends over the entire uh, reach of the, of the uh, uh, southern Sierra Nevada. And it gives rise to models, notions that the bedrock phosphorus supply in turn is in, in some fashion is controlling the vegetation, which in turn is controlling soil production rates and even the very presence of soil, whether or not you have bald, uh, bare rock or whether you have a soil mantled hill slope. Um, and this of course speaks back to the vegetation, giving rise to hypotheses about that, the, you know, about this chemical control on, on not just the vegetation itself, but ultimately on the rates at which the landscape itself is evolving, uh, rates at which sediment is coming off the landscape. Is this just simply a fun, is, what the linkage is between the phosphorus, the vegetation, and, and the, the expression of it is still not clear and is a, is a subject of, of, of quite a bit of interesting uh, discussion. I encourage you to read the paper. Another perspective. Uh, here we've been talking about the intrinsic controls of the, uh, the endogenous controls of rock on uh, the patterns of vegetation, on the patterns of soil. But uh, as uh, Natalia DeLing's work uh, uh, showed us in, in, uh, in the Central Oregon Cascades, the presence of external sources of sediment may be first order controls on the development of vegetation. Here is a lava flow uh, in the, the, the colored panel to the right uh, that's only 1600 years old and, and most of it is the LIDAR image reveals a very, uh, um, very uh, distinctive uh, uh, first order uh, lava flow structure, including the levees. But sitting in the middle of these flows are forests that are hundreds of years old, despite the fact that the flow itself is only 1,600 years old. How did they get there? And what Natalia has been able to show is that the reason why forests can develop in these very young pieces of the landscape is because in this case of, of, of flood and debris flow deposits that came down from glacial outburst floods and, and established themselves on, this, uh, uh, on these young lava flows. A similar story here uh, just up the road in another uh, very young 3,000-year-old lava flow with a old forest that is being supported in this case by tephrafall. So this idea that there are these extra <laughs> controls on vegetation patterns, that, that the material, fine grain material can come in from outside and basically set up, jumpstart uh, the formation of soil and eventually and, and, and thus dictate the terms of vegetation succession and, and forest development is in a sense an opposing hypothesis to the idea that it's an endogenous, uh, an endogenous uh, control. The CZOs 
in are attempting not, not only to capture these individual site-level relationships, but to tie it together into comprehensive models and pictures and, and frameworks for thinking of how material is being uh, forced, how it is evolving as it moves down through the hill slope and through river systems, how it changes as a result of depositional processes, and ultimately how it is conditioning water quality, including in the case of the Christina River slide, um, including in, in some very urbanized uh, river systems. So this becomes the challenge, is not just to speak about individual places, but then to put them into their watershed contexts that have uplands, riparian zones, rivers, uh, and, and depositional uh, areas, and to picture how this is all tied together. This is a real challenge. It's not easy to do uh, this kind of uh, integrated uh, thinking. So those are some of the science issues that are emerging. What about, but in order to move the critical zone science beyond just a series of fascinating site-based narratives of, 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 of change in place, there is, I think, in recent time, uh, a growing recognition of the need to move us towards a more theoretical foundation for critical zone science. Um, and perhaps a, 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 a brand new example of this, in fact, this hasn't even in, uh, reached the streets yet. This is a, a paper by Daniela Rempe and, and Bill Dietrich that uh, will be coming out in PNAS shortly. Um, they give us a very provocative thesis, which is that in contrast to the to what I would view was the common view that weathering uh, is primarily controlled as a top-down process, as uh, meteoric waters uh, charged with acids work their way down uh, through the critical zone. They pose a, 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 a theory, a hypothesis, that instead the weathering of uh, the bedrock, and hence the depth to the bedrock, is strongly controlled by the rate at which water is drained out of fresh bedrock, the very slow drainage of water out of fresh bedrock. So they provide a conceptual model that is, I'm not, I'm not, don't have the time to go through the details, but what is interesting about this theory is that it gives rise to some predictions about the nature of the landscape. For example, they, by virtue of being able to show that the, uh, the depth to bedrock is essentially being controlled by two fundamental variables, the uh, slope of the hydraulic gradient and the slope of the hill slope gradient, they begin to address some, some paradoxical issues, such as why is the soil at the ridgetop uh, commonly found to be the deepest uh, landscape, whereas we might anticipate or predict that it would be the shallowest. And they, they provide these models, they provide uh, some preliminary data, which is very uh, suggestive that these models uh, have, have some bearing. And the models furthermore make claims and, and predictions about the residence times of, of soil uh, as a function of these overarching controls of, of gradient and, 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 and uplift rates. And so what these models are doing is they're, provide, they're moving us towards a predictive science. We can now go out to places that we don't already know and make predictions about what the depth of the bedrock ought to be and, and, and test whether these ideas are in fact uh, uh, general, general principles or not. Um, another example of a theoretical development is emerging out of the, the uh, southwestern Jemez and Santa Catalina uh, critical zone observatories. Here they're taking a concept of energetics and using a common currency of energy where they do the full energy budget, the full calculus of energy as being a first order control on the development of the critical zone and the and key processes within it. So they have this, this idea of, of this uh, the, the, the en environmental energy and mass transfer, EEMT, which is shown conceptually here. And then they show that, that uh, uh, system relevant variables such as the Horton index, the ratio of, of evaporation to total precipitation, varies as a function of this EEMT, as a function of this total energy input into the system. How this plays out in different settings, how this relates to other uh, well-known energetic relationships such as the Boudicca curve, 
uh, remains an area of active interest and, and research. But the, the point is that these are now theories that we can begin to bring to places where we have not already made observations. So the evolving big picture that is really the exciting part of the science is that in contrast to that original Bevan and, and, and German model, we're now seeing how the unweathered bedrock is talking to the vegetation. We're seeing how the vegetation is talking back to the bedrock. The atmosphere is talking through the climate to the bedrock and the vegetation. Exogenous factors such as the wind or floods or, or, or fluvial deposition are talking to the soil, which in turn is talking to, to the vegetation. Uh, and the shallow subsurface is talking to the topography, which is also talking to the vegetation. And of course, it's all being tied together by the fluxes of water, by nutrients, and by carbon. This is a very interesting picture that's emerging, and it is fundamental to critical zone science that we are embracing this picture in all its complexity. And of course, the question then becomes, what trumps what where? With all these different models that are sort of swimming in your heads at the moment, how do we understand in any given place what are the most important controls? We look at the global picture of geology, vegetation, climate, and, and the subsurface, and we ask, what are the fundamental controls? That's where the emergence of this international effort to document critical zones, to observe them, to study them, and to report back into a common framework of, of, of sites becomes so important. And of course, what this is playing off against is not just the science, but the fact that underlying the critical zone, even, be, even deeper than the bedrock, is the critical nature of these interactions. The critical and critical zone refers to us. So here's the population of the Earth um, distributed uh, and, and we are having to ask ourselves now, it's not just how do these fundamental questions uh, that intrigue us so, uh, 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 what are the answers there, but really how can we use the science to help this burgeoning human population deal with the full suite of issues and challenges of which we're all too aware. Um, obviously, the critical zone itself is a... Um, is a, is a rememberer of, the his, of its own history. So we have the new Calhoun site. We see the gullies that developed in the, in the 30s and 40s. And these gullies are still present in the landscape, although they've become rounded and muted as the vegetation has regrown. We see agricultural landscapes in, 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 in the new uh, intensively managed landscape site and how efforts to remeander and reestablish rivers uh, are, are beginning to sort of propagate into this place. We see uh, the Christina River is a very strong human imprint over the, whole, over the whole place. And we're seeing this memory playing out in not just the landforms themselves, but in the actual constituents present in the critical zone. So, for example, some recent work uh, at Shale Hills is, is showing how the coal burning that occurred uh, due, to the, due to the iron smelting in this region during the 18... Uh, late 1800s, uh, leaves residues of very high uh, uh, lead uh, uh, concentrations in the critical zone itself. And this is obviously dictating uh, the terms of, of geochemical engagement within this region. So let me just conclude with a few comments about how we might go about using critical zone science to address these societal challenges because ultimately the success of this program is, is going to rest not just on its scientific accomplishments, but whether it can actually be relevant to the issues that we're facing globally. Um, I don't need to belabor the, the litany of woe that, that we, uh, the, the, you know, the new IPC report uh, lays this, that just came out today just lays this out all, all too well. But, but the world is changing, and it's changing faster than I think any of us uh, certainly anticipated uh, some time ago. And, and all of these disturbance processes are influencing the structure of the critical zone, the structure of the vegetation, and ultimately us uh, in, very, in very fundamental ways. And so we are, our science, of course, is, is needed in order to help people understand the linkages across these different things, that, 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 that disturbances such as fire are not just things in and of themselves, but they have legacies in terms of the carbon that's released, that changes the way vegetation 
uh, uh, grows. Uh, the, and the, the, the vegetation changes, the tree growth sequesters more carbon, uses more water, the water can dry out, putting the forest more at risk. So these cycles of, of disturbance of, of carbon, of water, these are not independent items. These are all together, and it's our science that helps us uh, uh, think about it, and it's, and it's a science that should be helping us communicate how these are linked uh, processes. But perhaps even more to the point, I think we are entering a time when we will be asked questions such as these. Can the critical zone actively, be actively managed to do things that we want done? For example, to store more water and carbon, to help ecosystems uh, adjust to, to, to changing environments, to reduce natural hazards. Uh, is this in the realm of possibility? And I submit that we've only begun to ask these questions. These are very, this idea of biogeoengineering, for some it's, it's anathema. For others, I believe it's something that we're going to have to be looking at very hard uh, in the future as, a, as a, a way of responding to the kinds of societal challenges we're faced with. What are some strategies that this, what might this look like? And I, I don't pretend to have an exhaustive list at all here, just some ideas that give you some, some idea. For example, um, can we manage uh, vegetation to uh, store more water as snowpack or to reduce the rate at which it melts, thereby uh, increasing soil moisture later in the growing season and even potentially augmenting uh, a scarce summer water resources? Uh, this is work that uh, Roger Bales and his group are, do, are, are thinking about and others. Uh, some recent work by Jessica Lundquist uh, and colleagues um, has demonstrated how, how complex this interaction is. It's not just a matter of opening up uh, uh, new clear cuts into the forest or thinning the trees, but where you are matters. So if you are, that, that the persistence of snow uh, is, is longer in forested areas in colder regions versus uh, in, in warmer regions. And so where you, met, where you are latitudinally, where you are in terms of temperature and climatic gradients, all of these things have to be brought into bear. But nonetheless, we have this as a potential option into the future. Could we, uh, even in a more far-fetched way, could we think about mulching forests? Can we do the same things in, in, in landscapes and even wildland la landscapes that we do with gardens, that is to preserve soil moisture uh, to make it last longer. And some recent uh, modeling that, that uh, uh, Christina Tague and, and our, our, uh, that we've written on has suggested certainly that you, if you were able to mulch landscapes and mulch trees, they would, the, the, the soil moisture would last longer and maybe even the trees themselves in the face of drought. The implications of this, of course, uh, in drying areas uh, still needs to be determined. Um, in general, I think we're seeing how the concept of critical zone process and structure is driving these ecosystem services that we care about. It's dr driving issues such as availability of carbon, water quality, uh, the stature and the condition and the health of the forest. And so this, this linkage between our science through these processes, through this, this zone, into things that we actually people actually care about, I think, is becoming uh, clearer and clearer as, as we go. So to conclude, what is so critical about the critical zone and, and by extension, critical zone observatories? What we're seeing is a growing network that represents a range, portfolio of landscapes, attempting to address fundamental questions, generating new perspectives, uh, generating new provocative uh, ideas and theories that are addressing key vital issues at a critical time. It's a very exciting time, and the invitation is there. This is not a club. This is intended to be a global international enterprise that advances our understanding of what is almost certainly the most critical of, of regions on the Earth. And with that, I thank you for your attention and happy to answer any of your questions. Thanks, Gordon. Now, I see we have 195 attendees, so before everyone unmutes their phone and starts talking, <laughs> how about if you have a question, um, either raise your hand using Adobe Connect or type it into the chat and we'll relay it to Gordon. Or, en or Enriqueta. <laughs>
I'm watching and Gordon. Gordon? Yes. Yes. I, I have a question. So I, I see that going back to that the end here where you were talking about mulching. Mm hmm. Can, do, do you have time while we're waiting to just expand briefly on that bottom uh, figure there of sure. mortality? Thanks. Uh, let, let me let me go back to it. This is uh, some rhesus modeling that uh, Christina Tig did as a uh, as we uh, a recent paper uh, in um, Frontiers in Ecology Environment. Um, the concept, what we we're doing with the model was an, a kind of experiment of saying, could you, in fact, if you changed by changing the uh, the, the the soil properties, in a sense, the the rate at which uh, ET, uh, particularly uh, evaporation, was occurring from the soil itself, from presumably, I mean, we we didn't mulch the model, but from the the change in the in the in the parameters that describe the soil itself could you in fact uh, take trees that were below a mortality threshold which was defined in terms of their non-structural carbohydrate percentages could you in fact grow them and could you persist over time um, such that they that they would not uh, die under circumstances that were quite akin to the uh, the uh, 2000 I think it was 2003 drought in uh, in the southern uh, southwestern US so these were pinion pines and uh, what we were it was really a proof of concept more than anything else or I, I don't think any should take this as a as a recipe for how to manage a forest but it was this idea that the the amount the, the way soil moisture is preserved by processes such as mulching, and there has been some empirical work along these lines, um, could in fact uh, keep trees uh, below mortality thresholds uh, uh, under under the, uh, a certain set of conditions. Does that make sense? Yes. I'm not seeing any raised hands or anything in the chat yet. So I'm, oh, now I see someone is typing. But I have, a Enriqueta, I have a question for you, which is. Okay, I'm back on. I'm just curious to know, um, in the past I've heard various members of the community, you know, talking about environmental gaps in the network, and you mentioned um, two possibilities, karst and urban, and, and I've heard discussion of high latitude and also coastal, and I'm just wondering if you care to mention anything about that or... Um, well, yes, those are all very all interesting very possibilities. Um, as I think that the way to proceed is that um, uh, perhaps, I mean, there, um, for the high latitude, uh, we do um, we could bring a partnership with the um, Division of Polar Programs here in, in the geosciences. And I, what I will encourage uh, the community is to um, think about organizing and perhaps submit a proposal for having a workshop so that it's not just um, one person, but in uh, a, a subset of the community organizes and kind of lays out the priorities that will allow the funding agencies, and I don't think it's just NSF, but it will be other funding agencies that will be interested in supporting an effort like that. Um, as you know, DOE has a like, like critical zone observatory that has a very strong component of modeling in Alaska. Um, and um, the same goes for the coastal area. There, the Christina River Basin touches some in the coastal areas, or, and the Eel River as well. But that is not exhaustive, and there are many more issues that could be considered. I mean, there's just the, uh, many, many opportunities. Uh, did that answer your question, Tim? Y yes. Um, I, and then I have one other question, which maybe 
I'm sorry if I'm hogging this here, but I'm not seeing any hands raised or... Oh, here, no, wait. I just got one from Suzanne. Gordon, your discussion of critical aspects of the critical zone focuses on water, climate, carbon. It's very easy. Is there... Could you... Okay. It's very easy to get drawn up into the shallow critical zone this way, yet the longer-term rock weathering processes have a role in all of those questions, too. Could you comment on how to make these linkages more apparent? Uh, yeah, that's that's a that's a good point. I mean, it it is easy to focus <laughs> closer to the surface than 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 far away. But I think I think the examples I gave uh, provide, and and certainly the work you guys are doing uh, provide the way to think about this. So, for example, uh, your work is, is clearly showing that there is a very tight connection between the topography, the climate, the soils, and, and the underlying bedrock, uh, which is not that, not that deep uh, in your environment. Um, the, the fact that the bedrock, uh, the, the, the weathering of bedrock itself appears to be controlling vegetation patterns, not just in the southern Sierras, but uh, I remember in, in, in Baltimore, in graduate school, we would go visit the, the ser serpentinite knobs, and, and uh, it was very clear that the bedrock was expressing itself, the weathering of bedrock. So I'm not sure I'm exactly answering your question. I think that it's not a – one doesn't have to reach very far, though, to see the couplings. Um, you know, if we're, if we're talking – Deep, deep bedrock. Uh, you know, it'll be interesting. Uh, we now have sites in the network, in the national network, such as in, in Illinois, where the bedrock's not really a factor, uh, at least not that we know about yet. Um, maybe we're going to learn something about places that have near surface bedrock and consequence of that versus places where the bedrock is, in a sense, out of play on at least uh, most measures. So I'm not sure I fully answered your question, but I think it's, it's this concept of thinking, not just stopping at the near surface, but going all the way down uh, is, is absolutely critical to our thinking of the critical zone. We're, we're, we're getting some dueling typing between Paul Brooks and Brooks. someone, so it's not coming through yet. <laughs> but um, here we are. Can you see these, Gordon? Uh, yeah. Okay. I'll so, just read them. Just to, yeah. Be helpful. To so read from them. Paul Brooks comes: Are there efforts, or is there interest at NSF to look at common observations, models, and questions across CZO and LTER sites? It seems that there is an opportunity to take advantage of diverse sites and expertise in a targeted effort. Uh, maybe Enriqueta can answer that one. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. Um, uh, certainly, I mean, the um, I think one of the um, items that we have brought up uh, many times uh, in the past, and I realize that is because the um, scientists are very involved with the activities at their site is to try to make the connections with the LTR, the co-locating sites, the LTR, and, and in now it's going to be the NEON sites. Um, so from the, um, you know, send the proposal that we can't um, uh, act on. But I, certainly this is the um, synergy between the um, sites that are already looking at questions that may not be asked or sciences like and take advantage of that. Um, so I think that this is, had been an intention from the beginning to be able to um, leverage on what is already available the, uh, and, and make the connections. So um, pretty much uh, the answer is yes, and um, uh, the more that can be done in that respect, the better beneficial for everyone. 
Gordon, since you um, since you were speaking to us from your role as the chair of the steering committee, I wonder if you'd be willing to just provide some perspective to the people that are still logged on, which I see is 167. Um, just of the role of the steering community co committee so far, but also moving forward. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so the steering committee has served in a rather interesting interface, a rather interesting zone uh, between the PIs, the site PIs, and National Science Foundation, and I would also say the broader scientific community. And in in I think in the way we've tended to think about things, um, we, we've tried to represent everybody to everybody else. Um, our interests are in trying to make sure that the network uh, evolves in an interesting, scientifically credible, uh, and, and ultimately open uh, uh, way that makes good use of the resources that the community is investing in it. And so specifically what we do is we, we've been present, at, we've gone to site visits, we're present at the meetings, and we do a lot of feedback. We try to think about what we've, we're seeing, uh, both the individual sites, but we spend a lot of time thinking about how to foster cross-site work. How do we come up with models, uh, frameworks, data structures, et cetera, that are going to make the, the whole greater than the sum of its parts. So does that answer? And we, yes. we're, and we're, we're an open, we, we try to provide an open portal. So if anybody has any issues about the, the whole CZOs that they want to discuss, uh, they're, they're more than welcome to contact uh, me or anyone else on the committee. Well, in spite of the uh, initial communication issue, uh, I thought that went really well. We had, I, I noticed that 202 participants was the maximum that I noticed, and so that we got a great response from the community. And, um, you know, I want to thank both of you for taking the time to do this, and tell everybody who's still logged on that this is something we intend to continue um, once the national is set up. Do you, Gordon or Enriqueta, would you like to make any closing statements? Well, I... Yes. Um, okay. Um, Gordon? No, go ahead, Enriqueta. Okay. So I think this was a fabulous experiment um, that... Uh, I'm looking forward to the to the future um, uh, opportunities that this will provide. I think it's a really good way to engage with the community. I mean, it's for everyone, um, NSF, the CCOs, and and and, uh, and even farther um, uh, internationally. Um, so I thank you, Tim, for um, organizing this. Uh, and the effort that you have taken to, to do all of this, and also for all of those that have participated. And just to remind you that we're open to uh, suggestions, ideas, um, and um, we just want uh, the success of the science and the community that it serves, and uh, anything that you can provide us with that will um, help us achieve the goal, that goal, um, we very much welcome it. So thanks again. Gordon, do you do you want to close? Uh, just to echo uh, uh, Enriquez and just uh, reiterate that this is, uh, it's all a work in progress, including <laughs> the webinar technology. And uh, just thank all of you for, for taking time out of your mornings and afternoons and evenings and for listening in and for bearing with the, uh, the issues. And hopefully it was useful. All right. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye.